much um, for having me to give uh, an overview of memos um, and for uh, to the organizers and the editors for organizing this book launch. It, the book looks absolutely fantastic. So first I'd like to extend my congratulations um, on behalf of memos. Um, so Medieval and Early Modern Orients or MEMOS was launched in June 2020 and it's an Arts and Humanities Research Council funded decolonial project that seeks to further knowledge and understanding of the early interactions during the medieval period and the early modern period between England and the Islamic worlds. And through our pages, so that includes of our news and events pages, which um, bring you all the latest in the field as far as um, news and uh, academic and non-academic events go, as well as our uh, empire pages, so our Mughal, uh, Ottoman and Safavid empire pages, which include maps and timelines of each empire, um, as well as our blog posts, which are written by our very diverse uh, and wonderful international research team, as well as some fantastic guest bloggers. Um, so through all of these things, we hope to create an accessible space in which to reveal the exciting discoveries of researchers as they uh, navigate the seas of history and of literature and investigate the um, intersecting webs of our past. And so like the engagements it explores, memos is also a point of engagement in itself. It's a space for um, researchers and practitioners um, alike and just anybody with an interest in uh, medieval and early modern studies, especially um, to do with race and empire. Um, it's a way for them to connect and stay up to date with news and events in the field, as well as the work of colleagues and specialists in the field. And by doing all of this, we hope to build a network that is um, one of knowledge and appreciation around the longstanding global relationships that continue to uh, define our interconnected identities and how they shape the world we live in and we hope that memos is contributing and will continue to contribute towards a really enriching and empowering understanding of our collective pasts presents and futures um, and another thing to mention that's very really we pride ourselves on this is our ethos is underpinned by uh a sense of collegiality because uh, Memos wishes to advance all of its members, uh, not just individuals. Um, and we pride ourselves also on uh, collaboration. So we work with various different research partners. Um, so like the Folger Shakespeare Library, the Hacklite Society, uh, Society for Renaissance Studies, um, and as well as accessibility because everything's free and easily accessible for um, people from all walks of life um, online. Um, and we enjoy celebrating the work of our members through highlighting our members' activities on the events and news pages, as well as on our social media platforms. So we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and we pride ourselves also um, on our decolonial approach, which examines transcultural encounters as exchange. And also um, another thing that's really important that uh, I think we do is advance underrepresented women of colour and people of colour scholarship because our editorial team is made up of women of colour and also our wider research team uh, includes a number of people of colour as well. Um, so that's just a brief overview on memos um, as much as I can fit in a short uh, short summary. So it's been uh, just one other thing I wanted to add is that it's been a pleasure to collaborate with the University of Liverpool on uh, this inaugural big book launch um, and congratulations again on what I'm sure will be a fantastic book that I'm very much looking forward to reading and I'll hand back to the organizer now. Thank you. Excellent, thanks, thanks Aisha. Um, okay, so we come to the book. I'm just gonna put in the chat just um, because why not the um, uh, two links. One is um, to Claritas books for the book itself and the other one is to um, uh, An Evil Empire. Uh, called Amazon, but sometimes it's more convenient. Um, so um, we come now to the book, and the book is obviously it's the story of um, Yusuf Sane Asmai, but it is also the story of um, uh, uh, William Henry Abdullah Quilliam, who is a figure who looms extraordinarily large um, in Liverpool's history um, as the founder of the first mosque community um, in Britain. 
depth. And um, we're really, really pleased today to be able to have as a kind of introduction to Quilliam and the Abdullah Quilliam Society, um, Farhad uh, Ahmad, who is um, the secretary um, of the society. And he's going to introduce Quilliam to us or talk a little bit about Quilliam and his legacy. Um, uh, the Abdullah Quilliam Society is the charity which runs um, that first um, historic mosque in England at, at 8 to 10 Brougham Terrace. Um, he's been a trustee of that since 2005, and he's been overseeing the uh, 1.8 million refurbishment of the mosque building uh, and expansion in 2019. Um, he also works as an, H an NHS non-executive director and civil servant, and he's active in interfaith and intercultural activities relating to cohesion and social entrepreneurship, both regionally and internationally. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts and a fellow of the Ayanda de Rothschild Foundation. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about the Abdullah Quilliam Society uh, for a few minutes now. Um, Fahad. Thanks, um, Dr. Bradley, and um, thank you to the organisers for giving me um, the opportunity to speak. I um, feel quite proud because it's my alma mater, having studied at um, Liverpool University. And uh, also special thanks to um, Yahya Burt, who, who actually um, is a, a big friend of the society and one of the authorities on Quilliam, so he actually kind of signposted me to the opportunity, so thanks for that. Um, I'm going to, I suppose, talk about four things, um, starting with, I suppose, a bit about um, 8 to 10 Brougham Terrace and the society, um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about, I suppose, the interest resurgence, I suppose, of interest in, in Abdullah Quilliam himself and his work. Um, then I'm going to talk a bit about, I suppose, his legacy and, and what we're doing, I suppose, as a, as a society to explore one aspect of that or some aspects of that. And then I suppose the final thing I want to talk about, of tying in with Black History Month, is a bit about, I suppose, how, how converts in general um, are received and, and some of the issues maybe we have around um, race within the Muslim community. So to start off, if I can just talk a bit about um, the society, and I suppose um, if I can break it into four phases. Um, so the first phase is, so Abdullah Quilliam, William, William Henry Quilliam, who, who changed his name to Abdullah Quilliam, he actually set up the historic first mosque in England um, in 1889 at 8 to 10 Brougham Terrace. Um, and um, it remained as a mosque until 1908. And, and one of the, um, the, the benefits of this new research from um, this book is actually, we understand now why it didn't remain a mosque for longer than that, uh, which was always a question mark uh, because it was basically in, in Abdullah Quilliam's personal name rather than held in a trust. Um, so in 1908, the building transfers ownership to the city council um, and becomes the births, marriages and deaths registry for the city. So it, it basically serves that purpose for a hundred years. So pretty much everyone in the city who's born before the year 2000 has some association with, with the mosque, albeit as a, as a births and marriage registry office. Um, in the year 2000, um, the building becomes surplus to requirements for the council. So they essentially pull out of the building. And at around the same time, 1997, um, a group of kind of local Muslim leaders, including um, some notable converts in Liverpool, set up the Abdullah Quilliam Society, uh, chiefly as a historical society more than anything. There were, there were no designs on the building at that point purely because people didn't know much about Abdullah Quilliam at all. Um, so the society then spots an opportunity to make a move on the building. Um, the council were kind, quite sympathetic to that. So I suppose um, there's, there's kind of negotiations with the council um, to hand the building back to the Muslim community for kind of cultural and heritage purposes. Um, those um, negotiations kind of come to a, um, a head in 2005. The council formally agreed to transfer the building um, for around £400,000. Um, and from 2005 to 2013, so this is kind of the point where I get involved, 
there's a real push to raise this money. Um, lots of MOFs are kind of in the UK are self-financed, you know, the vast majority. So it becomes a case of how do we raise this money to, to restore this building, which during this time, the five years in which the council have vacated, it's become very derelict. So it's in very poor condition. Um, and so from 2005 to 13, we are trying all sorts to try and raise this money. We started by trying to go to the Middle East um, to get some big wealthy Arab sheikhs to bankroll it. And uh, we went to the Maktoum Foundation, came back um, empty handed. Um, the mosque, the society actually had some very prominent Liverpool patrons. So Bishop James Jones was a patron, Lady Pilkington, who was the high sheriff, was a, was a patron. So we actually organized um, a meeting in the House of Lords through Bishop James with some ambassadors and prominent kind of Muslim peers. Um, so we did a pitch to try and get some funding that way, didn't work, um, came back empty handed. And then the final um, kind of fundraising strategy, if you like, that we pursued, which is where it really took off, was we said, this is the first mosque in England actually every Muslim in England has a stake in this mosque. So we're going to go for a grassroots, save England's first mosque campaign. Um, and that's essentially how we raised the funds. Um, we were able to open the doors. So I'm moving into phase three in 2014. So that's where worship resumes. We start um, kind of getting back into using it as a, as a normal mosque. Uh, so it's been used for the past seven years, um, five daily worship, Ramadan, uh, Eid prayers, uh, marriages and, and funerals, all that kind of stuff. Um, lots of open days and school visits and that kind of stuff. So it, it's quite busy and we've since expanded. So we've taken over next door, which is one to seven Brown Terrace. It's probably about four or five times bigger. So we essentially have the whole uh, parade, uh, which takes us into, I suppose, the future of the project, which is phase four, uh, which we're calling Quilliam Village. And part of that is around actually curating uh, a British Muslim Victorian experience. So we're actually trying to restore some things like Quilliam's original um, uh, printing press uh, or replicate these kind of things, uh, what Quilliam's kitchen would have looked like for when they used to feed the poor um, and, and maybe have actors to try and bring to life what, what Victorian Islam would have looked like. Um, so that's a bit about the society. I'm going to Try and quickly move uh, on. So, as um, Matthew said, um, it's a very important Liverpool story. And given how we're usually fascinated by Victorian eccentrics, I'm very surprised how little was known about Quilliam. You know, I was born and brought up in Liverpool, never knew anything about him. And his story is very colourful, as, as you've read from the book. Um, and because we have so many, you know, literary scholars, I'd be interested to know whether you see Quilliam as more of a Byronic hero or kind of a picaresque hero. Um, maybe Asmai might consider the latter. Um, but I think in terms of what Quilliam did, and to segue into my third point, Quilliam set up obviously the first mosque, but he also had um, a boys school, a girls school. He had the first Muslim publications, you know, newspapers. Um, he was corresponding all over the world. And I suppose that the challenge for us as current trustees, you know, custodians and if you like, of, of Quilliam's legacy to a large extent is, you know, how come there was no longevity of that? You know, we, we, I feel like we, we're developing an institution here, but there wasn't the kind of handing over the baton from Quilliam to us. Um, so I have to think, how come those institutions that he was setting up didn't take root and, and kind of once his charismatic leadership left, um, they fizzled out, the community goes to different parts of the UK, and we're kind of reconstructing it, I suppose. Um, and I think part of that is linked to, you know, some of the familiar challenges that we face today as, as British Muslims. I think we are trying to put in our roots into, you know, an authentic British Muslim identity. But when you look at the origin of mosques and, and, and schools, they're often linked to wider movements usually kind of uh, movements linked to geopolitics or linked to, you know, other countries. And obviously Quilliam, you know, he had major benefactors from Afghanistan and obviously from Turkey. So one of the things we've made a deliberate decision as the Abdullah Quilliam Society is we're actually 
going to be um, autonomous. We're not going to have any wider links to other movements. Um, and because sometimes funding comes with strings attached. So that's been a double-edged sword for us to try and pave a, um, our own, a plow our own furrow there. Um, the final point I want to make um, is about um, race. Um, so one of our trustees, who's, who's quite a well-known figure, and he himself is married to a convert, he actually said to us as trustees, you know, our mission is not complete as the Abdullah Quilliam Society until we have a, a white British local imam, and as Quilliam was, and a congregation of hundreds of white local British Muslims. Um, which kind of begs the question, as you know, people like myself who were, you know, my parents came from Bangladesh and were kind of generationally born into Islam. Are we actually prepared to let that happen? As, as Matthew said, you said at the beginning, are we um, open minded enough to allow local, you know, converts and reverts to take this religion in different directions? Or do we still have this inbuilt kind of chauvinism that we're actually the custodians of this religion. And I dare say for someone like Asme watching Quilliam, observing him, might he have had a similar kind of prejudice in his mind that, right, we, we need to police this guy. Um, and I still think that that is part of us, but I do want to just finally say, um, I don't know, you know, one of the other authorities on Quilliam is, is Ron Jeeves, Professor Ron Jeeves. And in his chapter of the biography, he actually says, Quilliam was the first multiculturalist. Um, he's conducting mixed marriages, you know, at a time when they're taboo. Um, and obviously, you know, going back to scripture and, and the example of the prophet, that was a very diverse community of Arabs and non-Arabs, Abyssinian slaves, all sorts. So I think this is kind of a modern mindset and it, it's definitely still a contemporary challenge that we're wrestling with. Um, I just finally like to just encourage everyone here to, um, there's an open invitation to you to visit um, the Abdullah Quilliam Society, the Brougham Terrace Mosque. And we have a website, I probably should have sent it um, in advance, but it's the Abdullah Quilliam Society.org. Um, so I encourage people to check out the rich resources there. We have the, the, the British Library um, extant writings of Quilliam. Um, so yes, I'm delighted to speak about Quilliam and any opportunity to discuss them is most welcome. So thanks again uh, for the invitation. I'm very looking forward to hearing everyone's presentations. Thanks, Farhad. If you want to pop the um, uh, web page in the chat, that probably is the most useful thing. So, yeah, thanks. Brilliant. OK, so uh, we come to um, uh, uh, Yusuf Samir Asmai and Islam in Victoria and Liverpool. Um, and um, in a sense, this is um, the, one of the claims of attention to this book is that it is um, an Ottoman account of this mosque community founded by a white convert. Um, and uh, doing the heroic work of uh, editing and translating uh, this book so um, it can reach that wider audience um, are two of the editors and translations uh, translators with us today. Um, and um, uh, that is uh, Munia Zeneb uh, Maxidolu, who's a PhD student of early modern studies at the University of Sussex. And her research is focused on um, Renaissance drama um, in conjunction with Anglo-Ottoman relations. And um, Yaya Burt, who's a community historian who's taught at the University of Leeds, has an MPhil in social and cultural anthropology from Oxford, and has published over a dozen peer-reviewed articles on Islam in Britain, um, including articles on Quilliam, I think I'm right in saying, um, and co-edited um, British Secularism and Religion, Islam, Society and State, which came out in 2016. Um, and so this is going to take the um, form of an interview with kind of readings from the book kind of interspersed uh, within it. Um, so I suppose um, I'm, I'm going to start with you, um, Yaya, if, you, if I can, which is just maybe outline for us the sort of broader context of uh, sort of Islam, the state of Islam in, in Victorian Britain, sort of the, the, the context into which Quilliam is, is, is operating and the context into which um, Asmaya is observing it. Uh, well, first of all, um, Matthew, thank you so much for the invitation to you and to Memoriants. Um, and it's a great it's a great pleasure to be um, having this in Liverpool. Um, so this is the first of, as you said, is what is a very much a Liverpool story. Um, so let, let, let me be concise and say that, you know, that there weren't that many Muslims in Britain in the 1890s, maybe less than 10,000. 
um, uh, and almost all of them had come to Britain because it was the heart of the greatest sort of land empire the world had seen, and it was linked together by trading routes um, by the by the by the mercantile fleet. Um, Liverpool was the second great port of of empire after London. All the passenger um, passengers came through, not just freight, until Southampton took that role in the 20th century. So many, as we'll hear later, many dignitaries, important dignitaries, came to England through Liverpool often and took the train subsequently down to London. Um, and so the, there were, you know, the, you, you had a mix of different kinds of Muslims coming to Britain. Um, you had uh, wealthy, uh, the wealthy of uh, in the British Empire, particularly from India, who came to study in Oxford and Cambridge in London and so on, often law, for instance, um, and set up Islamic societies in London. Um, uh, then you had uh, sort of working class peoples, you had nannies, uh, ayahs, as they were called, who looked after the children of Anglo-Indian families who had settled back in Britain. And then you had uh, Lascars, this was the term at the time used for um, a, a variety of Muslim um, sailors coming from around the uh, British mercantile trading routes from, uh, from Bengal, uh, uh, Gujarat, Yemen, Somalia land, Egypt and so on, uh, Morocco. So you had, they, they were all clubbed together into this umbrella term of Lascars. And, and Quilliam's, Quilliam, William Abdullah Henry Quilliam um, is part of this world. Um, he, he converts to Islam uh, in a journey, uh, first encounters Islam in a journey to Morocco in 1883, uh, convert, uh, announces his conversion publicly four years later. Um, he has a double training as a journalist and a solicitor, and he he has he he decides he's going to preach Islam, and this is what makes him an historically significant figure uh, in eighteen and eighty seven. And using um, he'd been brought up as a temperance campaigner, and he used those networks, those Wesleyan connections that he had, uh, to preach Islam amongst temperance society and to present Islam as the greatest temperance movement. Uh, in history. And he manages to uh, gather a small number of converts around him in those first three years, about um, two and a half years, about 20. And they have rented premises in Mount Vernon Street. And then they move uh, in December of uh, 1887 to Brown Terrace, um, where they found a more formally found a uh, sort of permanent mosque, uh, which is in an extension at the back of the building. Mm. So just, uh, um, you know, uh, in one sense, one obvious thing is what, what draws Quilliam to Islam in, in the first place? This is Well, he has, a, he has a very restless mind. He has a pretty religious upbringing. As I said, his parents were staunch uh, followers of the, um, uh, of, the, of the temperance movement. His father was a lay pre Methodist lay preacher, and they're brought up in the Wesleyan uh, tradition. Um, uh, they take religion tremendously seriously, but Quilliam is restless, kind of mind, uh, very, a, a great autodidact, interested in many different things. Um, and comparative religion is one of those things that he's interested in. Um, he may have been introduced to that through um, to other religions, through fringe Freemasonry. Um, and I think at the same time, he was also, uh, from a young age, quite disgusted by the kind of... Um, violent turns and rancorous turns that Christian sectarianism could have in Liverpool of the late 19th century. So quite often that, that was a big, uh, and sort of idealized Islam as a kind of unified whole, absolutely with lacking the sectarianism that, that Christianity had. But of course, um, that was idealization on his part, but, but nonetheless, that, that was what, uh, one of the things that attracted him. And of course, like many converts, he was, he was, attracted to its kind of um, uh, simple monotheism, uh, to its temperance, if you like, uh, and to it. He saw it as a religion of plain common sense in that very Victorian way, if you see what I mean. It accorded with reason and common sense and so on. Um, you know, so those are the terms in which he saw it. He's a fascinating example, isn't he, of, of that whole boom in comparative religion that comes in the 1880s and 90s, sort of, mangling not mangling but sort of coming into contact with 
um, the, the sort of a sort of a, quite a Protestant conversion sort of moral narrative. Do you know what I mean? It feels like these two things are kind of coming together. That sort of sense on internal transformation and conversion and moral good works sort of coming together with that interest in comparative religion, sort of in in part of the way he's thinking. Yeah, so certainly you do see a kind of attempt to define other traditions around the world in the light of Protestantism and Christianity as a whole, the idea of what a religion actually might be and that it, it's, you know, a bounded identity with certain rituals and people have a scripture and they have a should have an a, a ecclesiastical hierarchy and so on. And if any traditions don't have these things, then they're sort of seen as deficits to some sort of implicit idea of what religion ought to be yes. and so and this is obviously part and parcel of Br the british empire and it's kind of civilization civilizing mission of categorizing the world if you like in its own terms and obviously comparative religion developed in the 19th century is connected with that um and, and this is how i think you know this is a kind of way in which um that they often um these converts to islam often saw um Islam in Protestantizing terms, if I can put it that way. Mm. I think possibly because of that, that that sort of lack of the big institution in that way. There's there's sort of obvious obvious yeah. um, kind of comparisons. Um, yeah. Okay, so into this, so that's Quilliam and like that kind of context. Um, into that, obviously, steps Asmai, and I just wondered if we can get to you, Zainab. Could you um, talk us through a little bit about Asmai, sort of his background, how he comes to write this book, um, and so on. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks uh, for inviting us to this uh, book launch. That was very uh, exciting and thrilling for us to share with the wider audience our journey and how we came to translate this book and offer uh, to the people of interest. Um, Esmai is an interesting figure which uh, came to be known in Turkey very recently for entirely different reasons, but uh, Previously, he was totally an obscure figure. Um, he is a late Ottoman intellectual uh, who is born in southern Turkey, in modern southern Turkey. And then uh, apparently he's a very smart child uh, and he's sent to Köprülüoğlu Medrese in Istanbul in, in the, to the capital. Uh, and those students normally study on scholarship. Uh, that's the general rule. And then after his uh, studies, he's sent out to uh, Egypt, to Tanta, as a Turkish instructor in a Turkish uh, school, and in an Ottoman school, let's say. And that's where he settles down for the rest of his life. Uh, so he's a Turkish-born Ottoman intellectual from Cairo, so a very, you know, cosmopolitan figure, and he's uh, fluent in a few languages, uh, including Arabic, Italian, French, and uh, maybe a little bit English. And um, so he likes to travel, and uh, we know that he accompanies certain figures, you know, like a travel companion, like a bit aristocratic figures uh, in their journeys to Europe. Um, obviously, he's a sociable person and um, kind of intellectual, but also an entertaining kind of guy. Um, so he makes about three uh, journeys to England and people uh, in total three, but uh, before coming to Liverpool, he makes two other uh, journeys and when he goes back home to Cairo uh, people you know his friends you know ask him oh you know why I didn't you know go to Liverpool and see that famous uh, Muslim Institute and Quilliam and so on uh, that's what triggers him to you know undertake this journey and write this uh, travelogue I would say and uh, that's the story and how we came about uh, you know this book as it was through our uh, Muslim UK History Society in making uh, that we had a group that uh, you know on WhatsApp and you know someone sent uh, Riordan I think uh, our other 
editor, shout out to him, who is in France now. Um, he, you know, presented it to us and he was like, oh, you know, this is a very interesting, you know, uh, book. Why don't we, you know, translate it? And I volunteered and yeah, I also was uh, kind enough to help us out. So that's how uh, this book came about. I mean, uh, obviously, all the great intellectual leaps of our time come through WhatsApp. So uh, this is uh, this is um, all good news to see. So I think um, uh, Zainab, you were going to read us an extract, which I think I'm right in saying is is kind of where um, Asmai himself sets out why he decided to write this book about the Kulia Mosque in Liverpool. Right? Uh, it's it's the opening chapter. Uh, it's about you know, page fifty. Uh, the entitled a faint sound came from the west so who is Abdullah Quilliam why did he embrace Islam by leaving behind the protestantism into which he was born and raised what kind of resources has he relied upon to spread the religion of Muhammad among the English who are infamous for their bigotry oops is he blessed with learning of anything from the Islamic sciences and so forth etc at first glance doesn't addressing these queries seem reasonable well, changing one's religion is clearly not like changing one's shirt. It is worth considering that for a man who would not even like to change his shirt unless its color gets dirty, leaving the religion that he was born into and was brought up in and embracing another one requires much study and research on religions generally so that his conscience is satisfied in all respects. First of all, a person who sets out sincerely to change his religion becomes convinced of its fundamental shortcomings after examining it. Then he researches other religions in great detail and selects one from among them that he sees as the true one, as a true one. Otherwise, without this comparative approach, it should be concluded that this person is not serious at all. It is akin to attention-seeking people putting themselves into all kinds of situations just to gain fame or in constant lovesick youth changing from one season to the next. When Mr. Abdullah Kualiam visited the abode of Felicity, the seat of the Islamic Caliphate, that refers to Istanbul. We read about it, we read about it in our papers. Almost every day, we would see under Abdullah Kilim Efendi's name, the translation from English of his life, how and why he found guidance converted to Islam, and the achievements of the Islamic Institute that he established in Liverpool. In brief, we learned everything about him. During those days, the papers in Istanbul would even report how the crowd carried him over their heads from the court entrance to his office when this man of many virtues, who happened to be an attorney in Liverpool, won a case thanks to his proficiency in law, his competence in rhetoric and clarity of speech. The Muslim community's experience with Europe, which has equally developed in every aspect and with England in particular, has made them apprehensive of their tongues were swollen, as their tongues were swollen from the dainties that they took from them thinking they were sweet. Hence, they would not give up wondering, why has Mr. Quilliam become Muslim? Could it be due to a commercial interest? One could even find skeptics who thought that he considered the name of Islam as some sort of capital that would bring him profit in the form of charity, donations, financial assistance, and grants from the Islamic countries. Back then, this unworthy author used to think as much too, considering that there are no people in the world as attention seeking as Englishmen, and they would go to great lengths just to make their name appear in the paper just once, even to the point of sacrificing their lives to this end while suffering all sorts of privations. Might not our friend Mr. Quilliam be excused for doing the same in the cause of promoting Islam? Be that as it may, some friends remonstrated with me for not going to Liverpool to ascertain the truth with my own eyes by visiting my new brothers in Islam in their mosque. Even though I had previously traveled from Egypt to England twice and visited London and its surrounding cities, they were right to reprimand, reprimand me as it would be highly appreciated if I could bring them news about the Liverpool Muslim Institute and its Muslim culture instead of talking through my hat about the foggy English weather and the values and customs of its natives. I had my excuse for not having made it to Liverpool before. Nonetheless, I had heard the following from some Ottomans that I came across in London. Yes, it has a little rhyme, but no reason. Their Muslim practices are not like ours. They have recast the noble Quran as psalms and put it to music. They perform the prayers with music playing. 
My curiosity grew even more with this news, and I, taking it upon myself as a duty, promised myself that if I were to go to England again, I would definitely visit Liverpool in order to meet my new brothers in faith and study them in every respect. Thank God I have succeeded. For exactly 33 days, starting from the 23rd of this past month of Muharram, 16 July 1895, I have stayed in Liverpool and attended the mosque three times a week and met with one of our new brothers in faith every day to interview them. Apart from that, I have also gathered information from an Ottoman intellectual who has been staying there since the 18th of July, since the 18th, which corresponds to 11 July, and from some local Christians with whom contact has been established. I have noted everything in my journal daily to make sure that I did not forget anything. In addition to that, I'm obli obliged to tell you, tell my dear readers, that I informed Mr. Abdullah Quilliam I was going to publish a pamphlet entirely uh, entitled Islam in Liverpool upon my return to Egypt, and that I was going to be frank about whatever I, have, I had seen and heard, provided that I had verified and heard from them, the Liverpool Muslims, directly, with complete freedom and without concealing anything or obscuring the truth and ascertaining the real situation. He replied, by all means, please do write as such. We would be pleased with that. You are entirely free to compose your piece as you see fit while giving your own perspective on our character and customs. I have seen and noted in the contents of this pamphlet my impressions that can never quite capture <clears throat> the immediacy of seeing it for oneself. Therefore, may the readers forgive my shortcomings as a writer if they find that some of it does not correspond to what they have previously heard. Thank you. Excellent, funny. thank you, Zaya. Yes, I think you really, you get a sense even in that extract, don't you, of the very um, conversational um, way that Asmai writes um, and his use of, of kind of, of kind of quite a, quite a lot of humour that goes into into the way he, he talks. It's very, it's kind of, you, you, what you said before about him being kind of a colourful character, sort of like William is a colourful character, he's got kind of a similar thing. I also think it's really interesting, you get that little dance at the end, don't you, which is like, you know, well, I will write what I want, well, you can write what you want. Do you know what I mean? That feels like there's a kind of, there's a kind of uh, dance going on there. I think it's safe to say as well, I mean, this is no um, uh, news to anyone that's uh, read the book, that uh, Asme is, is sceptical of, of the Quilliam project. Um, and for, for many of the reasons that Farhad was, was outlining before, there are certain things he, he thinks are, are, are not Islamically correct. And I'm just wondering uh, to either of you, uh, you know, from what I found reading it, one of the things that interested me was, was where that came from, that, that sort of, is it, is it to do with his sense that Quilliam is sort of putting himself in it, which is that sort of, you know, Englishman can't resist being attention seeking, or is it something else? Or is there a kind of tension there? But what is it that sort of makes him so sceptical in a way of, 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 the, of Quilliam, Quilliam and, the, and the project? This is to either, so. Well, um, I, I will volunteer before uh, Yahya collects his thoughts about it. Um, I would say it comes from the tension that is already, you know, present in Cairo. Like he's living in a British, you know, mandated place. You know, it's not an entirely, you know, Ottoman dominion, but it's under, you know, the the pressure is so uh, present in his life. So Englishman is already a figure that is not very uh, friendly and sympathetic to an Ottoman living in, in Egypt, I presume. So that is, you know, the background to the pre-existing situation, I think makes him more skeptical. But also uh, I have to give that he's, he's a very cosmopolitan personality. He has non-Muslim friends. You know, he once mentions that someone uh, when he was visiting a Hungarian friend in Istanbul in his study, he bumped into another Hungarian and he liked, they liked each other's conversation so much so that he invited him over to Egypt. But with other Europeans, maybe that tension uh, is not there because they are not you know, uh, posing any threat to the very existence of an Ottoman uh, in Egypt, but um, 
for an Englishman, there is um, another dynamic. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, yeah, you want to say something? I think that that's it. I mean, the, the little that we don't know that much about Asmai's associations in Egypt, but we know that later on he translates uh, a work of a noted uh, Egyptian nas nationalist politician. Um, and so I think uh, at that point, um, uh, the, there was the argument was that the, the, Brit the Brit Britain should relinquish its control over Egypt and return it to the Ottomans. It had yet to sort of morph into an Egyptian independence movement. And Asmai was supportive of that. So I think that probably in the mid 1890s, he was heading in that direction. Um, certainly was already anti-British and wanted to see it return to, to, the, to, the, to the to a full Ottoman control. Uh, and so that certainly colors his um, his his views about the British. Um, and, and also in, in that light, Quilliam's project of a British Islam. Yeah, it's interesting as well, isn't it? That, that a very colorful character himself, one of the things he, he seems, I think, throughout the book to kind of object to is, is Quilliam making himself the story and being this kind of charismatic figure um that, that you know that and it, and it definitely ties in it was in the bit that you read out Zainab, that that sort of idea that this is something in the english national character of sort of showing off and trying things so you can say you've tried them and there's a there's a very big sort of skepticism yeah of course asma himself has many of those characteristics i don't mean showing off but he has a flamboyance about the way he writes there's a kind of um there's a kind of um you know, travel or abroad sort of humour that goes through it. So it's a very interesting kind of tension, maybe yeah. that happened within himself as much as it happened between him and, and Quilliam. Okay. They're both newspaper men. Yeah, Quilliam, exactly. you know, Quilliam has a double career. I mean, I think he's been overemphasized as a lawyer, but he has a double, as my puts his finger on it, he has a double career, double training as a lawyer and a journalist. And so they're both newspaper men, you know, they both founded newspapers. Um, as my found a, a, an Ottoman language newspaper in 1889, Misr, and uh, just a few years before Quilliam founds the Crescent, you know, so they both recognize, which had just started publication, um, a couple of years before us, my visit. So they're both, you know, they're both newspaper men. Mm. Uh, they both know the value of print and the value of, of perception and shaping perceptions and so on. And so I think that they recognize that, uh, probably recognize that in each other. Yeah. It's interesting as well, because that's one of Asma's big issues, isn't it? That the Crescent is kind of doing it too well. It's sort of, it's getting yeah. that message out too, too kind of strongly. And this is, part of the problem well but i think uh, this is what zainab said in an earlier interview we did didn't you that that it was almost succeeded too well didn't it zainab you were saying that quilliam's propaganda was a sort of double-edged sword for him i you know apart from you know uh that's my skepticism and you know unorthodox practices at lmi uh, liverpool muslim institute there's also this uh kind of lmi falling victim to their own public image because you know what they present in the paper is slightly exaggerated and polished and you know too good to be true uh, kind of um, image of a Muslim community and Muslim Institute so if you it's like meeting the actor that you were very you know you were a big fan of and then you are you know ultimately uh, disappointed because he's just a regular guy he, he's not the one in the movies you know being all heroic and you know extremely kind and generous and so on and so forth so uh if you read the crescent uh if you read the if you followed their publications lmi was a great it was a bacon of you know uh, faith in england it was where the you know the banner of islam was rising and so on and so forth and uh, this very well uh, displayed image was inevitably crushed when Esmai visited the place itself. And it was just like, you know, he, he sounds like a dream crusher to me because uh, the expectations versus the reality will never quite match. Mm. And that's, that's also the 
hello, you know, the port is also in, in Quilliam, you know, making it so grand on the paper, but also this is the nature of um, media, I think, you know, uh, no matter which century we are talking about. Very much so. So, um, yeah, yeah, we were going to, uh, on, the, on, the, on the sort of um, subject of PR, um, we were going to, uh, you were going to read a short extract from the book, which is about the visit of the Crown Prince. Yeah, so, uh, so I was just going to, as I was saying earlier, um, you know, uh, explaining earlier, you know, dignitaries came, often came to Britain through Liverpool, which carried a lot of the passenger passengers uh, from Empire. Uh, and, and one of the most august sort of visitors to the mosque was the Crown Prince of Afghanistan, who came on an official visit, sponsored by, you know, official visit, and, you know, had went to visit Victoria and London and all of that. Um, and so this is in 1895, and he came to the mosque uh, the month before Asmai arrives. And so uh, with the assistance, uh, we believe, of the Ottoman consul, who was also similarly sceptical about Quilliam, the, the Ottoman consul, trade consul uh, to Liverpool, um, who must have provided this account to Asmai. Uh, he writes uh, a, a rather sort of sardonic account of the of the um, Crown Prince's visit to the mosque um, and what happened. So I'm going to read out this section um, and um, I think it often speaks for itself. So His Highness, the Crown Prince of Afghanistan, Nasrullah Khan's visit to the Liverpool Muslim Institute, which took place when he came to see the city. For the Liverpool visit of His Highness with entourage, there was, there was an official welcoming ceremony. Mr. Quilliam was present there, attired in his Moroccan robes, with the extant male and female converts whom he made sure were dressed up in bizarre costumes, as well as a considerable number of friends. Although Mr. Quilliam and his group came uninvited, that's not true by the way, the official Liverpool troop of guards did not prevent them from walking up to the platform, certainly as a gesture towards Islam, or frankly to His Highness. As the carriage of His Highness pulled up at the station, Quilliam and his group chanted Allahu Akbar, and Mr. Quilliam's little daughter, and Miss Gibson from among the female converts who works in the Liverpool flower market, presented bouquets of flowers they had prepared for His Highness when he stepped onto the platform. One of the Muslims present during this ceremony describes the strange costumes that the female converts had put on Quilliam's put on at Quilliam's direction to imply that they follow the Islamic dress code. Some have wrapped a few meters of white cloth from their head, reaching to their breasts, only leaving their eyes and nostrils visible, while some others have a large piece of lace on their hats, hanging down at the sides, stood like a bride in her wedding veil, and some in particular wrapped a big handkerchief around their mouths and noses. Thus, they proved to his highness that they followed the Islamic dress code and showed to the people of Liverpool that this is how strangely Muslim women wear religious dress out on the street." End quote. When His Highness graced the Liverpool Mosque with his presence uh, to meet the male and female converts, he sat down for a while in the area that is dedicated to worship. One of the sp specific preemptory precautions that Mr. Quilliam had taken was to make sure that this place did not reflect its usual arrangement by removing and hiding the organ and the chairs the day before and organizing the place like a Muslim place of worship. While inside the mosque, all the male and female converts, in addition to some Christians, were introduced by Mr. Quilliam to his highness and his uncles who were accompanying him. Malana Barakatila, uh, that was the imam at the mosque at the time, acted as interpreter. As one of those present transcribed exactly the Persian conversation that took place through Malana Barakatullah's translation between His Highness and his uncles and Quilliam, this writer thought it fitting to present a few sentences of it for the amusement of our honorable readers. Introducing one of the female converts, Mr. Quilliam said, Miss Lily Ethel. His Highness Nasrullah Khan asked, what is her Muslim name? After thinking for a while, Mr. Quilliam said one of the female Muslim names that popped in came to his mind, which was Khadija. It is Khaduja, he replied. Very well, praise be to Allah, 
His Highness replied, I am very pleased that she is a Muslim now. She is better than us because we are sinners and our sister is not. Meanwhile, the uncles of His Highness remarked, this quilliam is quite hardworking and diligent because it is difficult to spread the religion in a disbelieving country and among the infidels. Mr. Quilliam then introduced someone as the butcher of the Liverpool Muslims, certainly because he had read in the papers that His Highness, the Crown Prince, had brought his own butcher and cook to England. At the end of the reception, Mr. Quilliam presented His Highness, the Crown Prince, with a list that contained the names of the male and female converts. Just before he left the mosque, His, his Highness Nasrullah Khan, who was exceedingly pleased with this state of affairs, announced that £2,500 had been gifted to the Liverpool Muslim Institute. Mr. Quilliam, who was all ears at the announcement of this Islamic donation, said he was going to build a mosque in Nasrullah Khan's name in Liverpool with this money, to which His Highness replied, I find it more appropriate that you name it after my benefactor, my noble father, His Highness Abdurrahman Khan, who is still, still is the ruler of Afghanistan and said farewell to the mosque. Thanks, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, you see the journalist at work there, don't you? And I, I'm always I've struck with that extract about how much he plays kind of English middle-class mores against um, sort of the, what he sees as a kind of pretense Muslim. You know, she used to look at the flower market or they all went mad. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's quite a, a strong sense of that, that kind of cultural thing. So I'm just, I'm just um, curious, um, you know, because in a way this is about... Quilliam sort of trying to put, you know, trying, you know, possibly fundraising, but also trying to put his projects in the best possible light for the Crown Prince. And I'm just wondering how Quilliam's project was seen in Ottoman countries. I mean, we heard from Zainab's um, uh, extract before that, you know, there seemed to be some kind of pressure on him to go and see it. So it obviously was known about um, in quite a significant way. And I'm just wondering, so was it, how was its reputation in in and it's it's uh, basically Quilliam worked with Malana Barakatala, who we heard about earlier. They had a letter letter writing campaign of about three years duration, where they wrote to Muslim leaders and potentates and built up those connections. Um, and and they had a striking success with the Afghan court. It was a big deal that the Crown Prince officially came to the Liverpool Mosque. It was a big deal that he gave it such a large sum of money. Certainly, probably Quilliam's most um, uh, most greatest success uh, when it came to financial support uh, from a Muslim uh, a Muslim leader, as well as recognition. They 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 in Afghan correspondence, he's named as the leader of Lib of British Muslims and so on, and called Sheikh al Islam of the British Isles by 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 not by this Amir of Afghanistan, but by his successor, um, and so. Um, um, it's certainly that propaganda, that letter writing campaign was extremist, which was multilingual, conducted in three or four different languages, uh, was, was very successful. Um, and, and Quilliam regarded his greatest benefactor as the Ottoman Caliph, um, Abdul Hamid II, um, and he visited him on a number of occasions. Um, and um, uh, one of the interesting things is that um, he it's most likely that a couple of years after Asmai's pamphlet was published, and as we can, we've heard the extracts, it was skeptical and critical. Quilliam had a private audience with the caliph and managed to uh, persuade the caliph to, or appeal to the pay, caliph to ban the book. And the ban was subsequently, what was the book was banned in the Ottoman domains 30 days later. Uh, I mean, there are many reasons why books were banned by the Ottomans, but it seems likely that given the timing, that this was a, a Quilliam's request. Um, uh, so it shows that he had the trust of the Caliph, or the Caliph at the very least saw the utility of, of, of the Liverpool Muslim Institute as a presence in Britain at the time, despite the fact he was well aware of the scepticism of his own Ottoman officials in Liverpool. He wrote back, we have it in the Ottoman archives, they wrote back regularly at the disquiet at, at some of the things that were going on. But obviously the Caliph, overruled that uh, but as to exactly why we're not sure um you know the ottoman archives don't tell us but certainly we can see that 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 effectively they were their protests were ignored yeah it's interesting isn't it like that clash between them as well because what you're describing there is being able to very very cleverly play 
to different audiences in order to further your mission, as you see it. But mm. actually, that very playing to different audiences, as my reads, is kind of inauthentic or, or cynical in some way. I suppose that's one of the differences between them, that they see that that those those, those sort of opportunities, as, as perhaps Quillian would see it, or those those um, kind of acts of bad faith, as perhaps as might have seen it, in very different yeah. terms. Well, he, he had a difficult job because, I mean, obviously the, the, he was he was essentially an autodidact, Quilliam. He, he kind of learned his Islam on his own in the 1880s, relying on 19th century British Orientalist scholarship, basically, to do so. Um, and so concocted a sort of um, Sunday service that looked, in, in form, looked like um, a Protestant service, but with Islam Islamized content. Um, it included, you know, standing up, singing hymns um, that were had Islamic lyrics, but were classics that were sung in churches all over Liverpool at 7 p.m. on a Sunday in the same way, um, you know, and all the other liturgical particulars of a Protestant service were there. Now, to the Muslim world at large, that was called a sort of um, Lek dawa, uh, preaching lectures, based essentially a way of preaching Islam. But for uh, what Asmai captures in his account, um, uh, and what Muslim critical Muslim uh, Christian missionaries who wanted to debunk Quilliam for their own purposes, when they walked in, they all thought it was an act of worship. So, mm -hmm. so I think that you know it it was part of the evolution of this community that while they were describing themselves as the Church of Islam, it wasn't described as a mosque, it was described as Church of Islam to, up to at least 1894. To the passerby in the street, they wanted to present it as, as the Church of Islam. Uh, and they, they had a lot of difficulties in the early years with you know, passerby throwing stones and people storming, um, storming worship and services and things like that. So they had a kind of hostile environment in the early 1890s. But to the Muslim world at large, especially after the publication, you know, even before the publication of the Crescent, there was a huge amount of reporting, as we've heard, in the in the Ottoman press, in 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 the in the North Africa, in, in British India. So so this this community, the foundation of this community, had become a sensation basically. But the thing is that they had that orthodox expectation. So once Muslim visitors started to arrive, say, well, then that's not how you conduct a service. You know, a pr Friday prayer should be on a Friday. Uh, sorry, in the afternoon of a Friday, not held sporadically on a Friday evening or or held on a Sunday or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they were sort of objecting to the lack of orthodoxy. So I think Quilliam, in the 1895 period, he was caught but a little bit between a rock and a hard place, and the community was in a sort of a transition, perhaps, away towards more sort of orthodox forms of practice. But it wasn't a sort of clean and tidy process and you know the hiding of the organ and things like that yes I think that as my uh, as my you know decides to see that um in as negative a way as he could if you see what I mean so um it's, I mean it's yeah. extraordinary as someone that spent a reasonable amount of time looking at kind of um religious disputes within Christianity it's amazing at the same time you've got you know um, Christian clergymen going to prison for certain acts of ritual worship that aren't okay with other uh, kind of uh, Christian groups uh, with the Church of England you know you've got people who have a slightly too fancy altar sort of being marched off to prison um, and so it's it's fascinating how much it parallels those those similar debates in Christianity going on at that time. Mm -hmm. um, before we're going to open it um, to questions I'll talk about how that's going to work in a minute but um, just before we do a uh, final question just to Zainab really which is the most preposterously open-ended question in the world, but I'll let you answer it in whichever way you would like, which is really what do you think that Asmai and Asmai's book kind of has to say to us today? You know, what is what is the thing that, that we will learn, you know, for us, you know, that will be relevant to us today from Asmai, from Asmai's book specifically? Both are two general and horrible questions. Yeah, um, well, I would say, um, when I first read it, I, I was a bit scandalized, of course, because of the allegations that are in the book. Um, and I was even afraid to share it with Yahya because, you know, <laughs> uh, confessions. <laughs> uh, because Quilliam is a, um, is a leading figure, is a kind of uh, idealized in many respects uh, for the Muslim community in Britain. So um, 
coming up uh, with a harsh criticism of his character would um, be emotionally troubling uh, for some of the readers and the audience. That was my concern. And I also thought, well, how um, contemporary and relevant this issue is, because we still have those uh, Muslim leader figures and their questionable um, acts and uh, attitude uh, toward the audience and uh, their inflated ego that leads to some errors that we find um, inexcusable uh, in some cases. And some of our community thinks that it is excusable. Uh, I don't want to name names, but you know, uh, many those uh, imams popped up in my mind when I was reading uh, the book. And so I think uh, the lesson to take is not to idealize anyone. You know, everyone uh, is a human at the end of the day and uh, attaching too much meaning to a person is not beneficial uh, for, our, our, for our spiritual growth and uh, our faith. Uh, that's my take on it. Uh, Brilliant, Zainab. Thank you very much. It remains it falls to me really to say thanks to our um, speakers, thanks to Aisha for introducing memos, but also obviously thanks to Farhad, uh, Zainab, and Yaha for such an interesting presentation. I think it's it's so good to be able to debate these things that are difficult and and are about differences of religious opinion um, and play into certain kinds of very sensitive cultural politics in a way that actually acknowledges the complexities of those debates and, and what's at stake for all groups so I'm, I'm i was delighted to be able to host this thank you very much thank you very much for having us thank you okay yeah, thank, you, thank you and thank you everyone and thank you everyone for coming as well yes, yeah thank you uh, thank you to la Barba as well for helping put this together yes indeed thank you very much